At the heart of these animated conversations lies Ottawa, where political tensions are reaching an unprecedented fever pitch. Something extraordinary is unfolding within the corridors of power, as the House of Commons transforms into a stage for what many describe as a riveting political thriller. With unexpected twists and turns lurking around every corner, this spectacle has captivated seasoned political analysts and everyday citizens alike, leaving them continually eager to see what happens next. Canada's political scene is currently catching more eyes than a moose on the highway, drawing intense attention from both domestic and international onlookers. This surge of interest is not confined to the bustling metropolises of Toronto and Montreal. Rather, it has spread through the serene landscapes of the Atlantic provinces and the vast expanses of the prairies. Central to this political saga is a looming non-confidence vote, buzzing with intrigue and dramatic interplay. Join us as we delve into this captivating narrative, exploring the intricate dance between the Liberal government and their steadfast opposition. Welcome back to Street Politics Canada. In the realm of Canadian politics, where campaign promises often melt away faster than snow in July, the current confrontation within the House of Commons offers a stunning exhibition of classic liberal choreography. As tensions rise, the ever-watchful eyes of Speaker of the House, Greg Fergus, intervene with the decisiveness reminiscent of a seasoned hockey referee restoring peace amidst an on-ice scuffle. By strategically scheduling opposition days for later in the week, he raises the stakes introducing the possibility of facing yet another non-confidence vote. This looming challenge has liberal strategists running hot under the collar, especially exacerbated by the re-emergence of a tactic many believed was confined to fictional political thrillers, the filibuster. The dramatic display of filibustering stems from the Conservative Party's persistent demands for transparency, particularly regarding government expenditures that have drifted into ambiguity none more so than the funds tied to a defunct green technology scheme. This saga of financial opacity has sparked not only a procedural reckoning within the halls of parliament, but also a broader discourse on environmental policy and governmental accountability. Questions of fiscal responsibility and the integrity of political pledges are forefront, creating a ripple effect of scrutiny that extends beyond political borders. Traditionally vocal critics of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, the Conservatives have, in this instance, forged unexpected alliances, most notably with Jagmeet Singh's NDP a party also echoing dissatisfaction with the current government. Watching these opposition forces unite is akin to witnessing a spirited family reunion, where bickering participants find a shared purpose in their mutual quest for accountability. I agree with the NDP leader who said, the Liberal government will always step in to make sure unions have no power. The minister's Section 107 referrals took away workers' rights to strike. As a result of this, Conservatives believe that this Liberal government has lost the confidence of the House of Commons. Now this puts the NDP and the NDP leader in a tough spot. Will he support his own words, support workers, or continue to prop up this NDP Liberal government, or will the government throw their coalition buddy a line and call a carbon tax election? Leon? Order. Order. The Honourable Minister of uh, Labour and Seniors. Mr. Speaker, you would think this was not from the party that supported the anti-union oppressive Bill C-377 and Bill C-525. You would think this wasn't from the party who has in its own policy handbook the fact that they will be bringing in right-to-work Alabama-style legislation into this House. You would think that that wasn't the party that refused to debate that very motion this morning in this House of Commons. Order. The Honourable Member from dufferin Caledon. So his defense of his decision to take away a worker's right to strike is to talk about some things from a few years ago. Unions have unilaterally condemned the Section 107 referrals, and the NDP leader said he intervenes to take away unions' power. That's true. He took away the Teamsters' right to strike. He took away the ILWU's 514's right to strike. But when Unifor 1541 asked him to intervene to prevent union busting, this minister disappears. But the leader of the NDP has a choice to make. Will they keep propping up these guys that make these anti-worker decisions, or will they he just stand with his words and vote again? 
I'm going to ask all members, please, to remind themselves that they have to keep their voices down so that those who participate uh, using translation can hear the interpretation. The Honourable Leader, uh, the Honourable Minister of Labour and for Seniors. You would think that wasn't the party that opposed 10 sick days for f employees in federally re regulated industries. You would think that that was a party that didn't have right to work Mississippi style legislation in its policy platform. You would think that wasn't the party whose very leader, whose very leader decried the involvement of unions in the procurement and other processes. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this Conservative Party is anti-worker. They've proved it on every single occasion that they're able to do it, and we will always stand for workers in this country. This joint effort underscores a burgeoning camaraderie rooted in shared goals and aspirations, highlighting the potential for formidable engagement in the political arena. As the spirit of collaboration unfolds, the possibility for significant change looms on the horizon, suggesting that partisan divides can be surmounted in the interest of common goals. Over the last five years, food prices in Canada have increased 37% faster than in the United States. That gap opened after the introduction of the carbon tax, which this government now, uh, with the NDP's help, wants to quadruple. The consequence is that in the last four years, food bank use in Ontario is up 86% and one in four children go to school hungry, according to this government's own data. So why won't they ax this crazy plan to quadruple the carbon tax? In fact, why not ax the tax altogether? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House of Commons. Mr. Speaker, yet another example of the Conservative leader talking about one thing and doing another. Mr. Yep. Speaker, when it comes to supporting children, we have been negotiating school food agreements that are helping actually 200,000 children across this country, and yet the Conservative leader is opposed to that. He talks about lowering taxes, but last week he made every single one of his MPs vote against a GST tax cut for Canadians. He also talks about wanting to hold an opposition day. But we gave him an opportunity today and he ran away from it. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, that's what weakness looks like when it comes to leadership. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Moving past the playful rhetoric, the conservative strategy to withhold cooperation until key conditions are met, chief among them the release of unredacted documents carries significant weight. The political arena, where transparency is an elusive goal, is currently dominated by this quest for clarity. Meanwhile, the Bloc Québécois stays deftly maneuvered on the sidelines, cleverly ensuring their continued relevance by suggesting conditional support for non-confidence motions that advance Quebec's interests. This delicate dance supports both provincial sovereignty and the steadfast preservation of French cultural heritage, clearly highlighting their enduring commitment to these pivotal issues. Their stance offers a nuanced perspective on national unity and the ongoing quest for a balanced federation. In stark contrast, Liberal House Leader Karina Gould seeks to alter the narrative by casting the Conservatives in a rebellious, disruptive light. Her rhetoric, marred by dismissive caricatures of Pierre Polyev's actions as weak and pathetic, could well be an attempt to deflect any public trepidation regarding vulnerabilities within Liberal ranks. Yet Canadians known for their pragmatism and healthy skepticism may well perceive this as a quintessential example of calling the pot kettle black, dismissing it as political gamesmanship. This contentious back and forth reflects the passionate and often volatile dynamics coursing through Canada's political landscape today, with each party jockeying for public favor amid an escalating series of challenges. I just wanted to talk very briefly about the situation in the House and provide an update. Um, today I presented a motion to allow the Conservatives to have an Opposition Day motion, uh, to have two in fact this week, um, and I just find it very ironic that over the weekend uh, Mr. Polyev, the leader of the Conservatives, was tweeting out um, about what motion he would debate and yet when given the opportunity uh, they declined it. And all I can say is that again, this is just a typical pattern of behavior from the leader of the opposition who says one thing does another. And so, you know, I just don't think Canadians um, are going to be conned by his, you know, doublespeak. He's speaking out of both sides of his mouth. Um, and all 
I can say is that there's clearly something he's afraid of, which I guess is losing yet again another confidence motion. But for someone who keeps talking about the fact that he wants to take us to an election, um, it's pretty weak if he's avoiding the opportunity to do that. Um, and I just find it extremely... Um, I don't know if it's disappointing or pathetic from the Conservatives that, you know, instead of moving forward with, you know, so-called, they're, you know, they're talking of a big game and all this stuff when, you know, the rubber hits the road, they're actually too afraid to move forward. But both the NDP and the Bloc uh, had agreed to move forward to pause the privilege debate so that we could move forward with the estimates. And it's just the Conservatives that continue to obstruct the work of Parliament. The air is dense with conspiracy whispers and emergent strategic partnerships fostering an atmosphere laden with cautious skepticism and speculative fervor. The relentless push by the Conservatives for concrete transparency and accountability is a stark contrast to the Liberal leadership's attempts to maintain the status quo through a mix of promises and evasions. This evolving political potluck provides more than mere media soundbites. It serves as a comprehensive course of speculation and prudent satire, an entree destined to define Canada's political landscape moving forward. As December 10th approaches, a date mired in the potential freezing of the national budget, the implications of a failure to reach a resolution could be immense. It risks diverting public attention from the festive celebrations to economic and political repercussions that resonate across the nation, casting a shadow over both present policies and future directions. Beyond the urban chatter, the rhythms of political discourse have permeated even the most remote communities, shifting the focus to the intricacies of governance and policy making that touch on every facet of Canadian life. As the fabric of Canada's political theater continues to unravel with each passing day, citizens from across this vast nation may find themselves irresistibly drawn to the unfolding spectacle, akin to watching an unpredictable, thrilling drama play out before their eyes. This saga is captivating, enticing Canadians to engage deeply with a scene set for a classic storyline filled with suspense, drama, and an ever-present potential for unforeseen twists. The juxtaposition of maintaining a steady government course with impassioned calls for accountability encapsulates the vibrant tableau of Canada's current political climate. This engagement reflects a broader commitment to participative governance, where informed citizens play a pivotal role in shaping legislative outcomes that resonate with democratic values. As the Liberals strive to fortify their position through strategic maneuvers, various opposition parties vociferously advocate for substantive change, outlining an electoral landscape on the cusp of transformation. This political battleground incites crucial inquiries about the fate of Canada's governance and democracy. As Canadians ponder the future, they should consider how their personal values resonate with the dynamic political strategies and narratives being woven on the national stage. By weighing the implications of current policies against the backdrop of their own ideals, citizens forge a meaningful connection between political action and community well-being. Well, that's all for now. Do you think this motion will differ from the usual procedures? How is this particular impasse going to impact the governance of Canada? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, kindly subscribe and leave a like for this video and our other videos because they go a long way in helping our latest content rank. Follow us on our new Twitter account, where we post stuff we can't post on YouTube. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks again for your support, and we'll see you in the next one.